Hey everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics. Today, uh, on my drive up to Georgia Optics, I was uh, on my phone when I'm sitting in traffic because the vehicle wasn't moving, so I was like, hey, let me take a quick thing and check the news. And I saw this article on CNN Money about should civilians be allowed to own body armor? Uh, why not? Uh, this is something that comes up from time to time because there's people, uh, especially in our, our government, who believe that citizens shouldn't have access, or I should say, and I wish I had bigger fingers to air quote this, civilians shouldn't have access to body armor. The reasoning given is that body armor can be used in crime and it would make law enforcement or you know someone else it harder to stop the criminal. So right now, if you're watching this and you're kind of on the fence about the topic, and you're probably not, because I don't know how many people uh, from the other side of uh, the gun control, body armor control debate, watch my videos. But, but if you are, if you're on the fence a little bit, what I want you to do right now is think to yourself, when is the last time body armor was used by a criminal? Go on, I'll wait. <laughs> Cats are funny. Could really drive this point home if I was wearing a watch and I could dramatically look at it. So did you think of anything? Probably not. Now, body armor has been used by criminals um, in crimes. They have worn it. Uh, its effectiveness, probably the most prolific example would be the uh, Hollywood shootout bank robbery that has been made into a couple of really bad made-for-TV movies and often lauded and talked about from both sides of the uh, the argument, but point is, it has been used, but it doesn't even register as a percentage of how often it's used in crimes because body armor is cost prohibitive and generally not something someone who's untrained really considers. They know it exists, but they not, might not pursue it. Now, when I was still a patrol officer, I remember uh, being in my dispatch center because it was a weekend, it was slow, and I swung by the station and I was hanging out, and my sergeant was up there, shift sergeant. And uh, there was something on the TV that one of the dispatchers was watching because it was that slow. Uh, and the body armor thing came up. And I remember him doing the, the, the classic cop shirt and belt thing and being like, I don't think civilians should be allowed to own body armor. I remember asking him, well, we have body armor. He's like, yeah, but we're cops. So I'm like, okay, but why do we wear it? Well, because you know we go out there and we might deal with somebody who could shoot us and, and body armor is gonna help save our lives. And I was like, that last part right there, help save our lives. Do you think that you have more of a right to self-protection than a civilian does? And he didn't honestly have an answer for that question. I'm glad he didn't try to hit me with some hubris or something, well, it's different for us or something like that. And hopefully I made him really think about his point of view. And if I didn't, well, oh well, you know? I'm not here to change everybody's mind. But my point to him was pretty much my point to anyone who's on the fence about this body armor thing. Civilians, air quotes again, citizens should have access to any means of self-protection that is warranted. Does a citizen have the same right to self-protection as a police officer? Yeah, they do. Now, some of you say, well, they don't do the same thing cops do. And that's tr totally 100% correct. Cops sometimes drive to gunfights, whereas the average citizen, the risk isn't as high, depending on how you look at it. But the point is, if they have a reasonable expectation to ever find themselves in a, in a threatening situation, um, they should have access to body armor. It's really not factually a big deal. Uh, the complaint and the issue is, well, if you know civilians can buy body armor, it's easier for criminals to get hold of it. You know, uh, there, there's a, a lot of processes we go through to buy firearms in this country, and somehow criminals keep getting a hold of those too. Uh, I honestly believe that this is more of an emotionally driven debate than it is a factually driven debate. Uh, just like gun control is usually more emotionally driven than it is factually driven. You get into a conversation with someone and they keep saying, I feel, I feel like, I don't think because I feel. Um, they're bringing their own emotional bias into the conversation instead of factually looking at the situation and saying, you know what, I can't remember the last time body armor was used by a criminal. Does that necessarily mean anything different. I think the general idea is if we keep, if we make body armor illegal for citizens to own, then criminals can't get it. Well, we already know that's not true. 
but it could be an attempt at a generational um, so-called embargo uh, on the possession of body armor just like they'd like to do with firearms. They think that after so many years of something being illegal, then no one will be able to get it. They'll be able to prevent a proliferation of body armor being available so then criminals can't have it. Well, if citizens can't have it, criminals can't have it. That's, that's my problem right there. Uh, you're basically saying no one's allowed to have this because of the possibility that a bad person can use it. Well, there's a lot of things in this country that are illegal. Um, some of them rightly so, and some of them it doesn't quite make sense. But I am not willing as a citizen to give my government the right to deem how I can protect myself when they cannot readily say with all honesty, I will always be there to protect you. And I don't mean at the, the large federal level, I mean all the way down to the local municipalities. Can you talk to any cop, any deputy in your jurisdiction and say, hey man, if I have ever a problem, are you going to be right there and you're going to be able to protect me? No cop is going to be able to honestly say, yeah, dude, I'm totally going to be there for you. Because it's just impossible. It's not that they might not want to be there. It's just that they physically cannot be there. Well, what situation would you never need body armor for? I am not in the business of predicting the future. And people who are anti-body armor or anti-gun shouldn't be either. But what they're trying to do is say, well, you know, it doesn't happen every day, so it's probably not going to happen to you. And I'm not really big on betting my, my life on the law averages. I can drive around for years and not have a vehicle accident, but when I get on the highway, I still put my seatbelt on. And I'm still glad that my car has airbags and, and other safety features. Well, you know, the car thing's kind of tired. The car thing is kind of tired, but the reason we use cars as an analogy to other things that you want to take away from us is because everyone can identify with a vehicle unless you've never driven one, which is, you know, a small percentage or never ridden one or never understand or don't understand the wisdom and the safety features that a vehicle provides. So the vehicle is always going to be an analogy we use for gun control. Granted, guns are a natural right recognized by the Constitution, natural right to self-defense. Cars are not recognized by the Constitution, yet readily available. Uh, and it's actually in some situations easier to get a vehicle than it is a gun. So the, the other part of this, and, and I think really one of my motivating factors for, uh, for doing this quick little video is, um, it was Link. And he said, hey, go over there and, and there's a poll and tell them how you feel. And I was like, yeah, I'll click on, see what's going on. Because CNN always does those polls. Uh, and I went over there and there's so many pro-Second Amendment people in there bashing the very idea of outlying body armor. Rightfully so. But then I thought to myself, like, I wish I could get these people this fired up over every single attempt at encroachment on their rights. It's easy to click a link and take 30 seconds to click a yes or a no, or a maybe, or an I don't know, or I don't really know how I feel today, one of them little bubbles, multiple choice. It's not as easy to call your congressman and write your congressman. It's not as easy to canvas for a politician. It's not as easy to vote. Uh, there's a lot of guys out there that aren't even registered to vote, and you know who you are. Uh, it's not as easy to protect your rights when it costs you more of your time. And I get it, time's valuable. But we are not going to be able to stop the removal and the encroachment on our rights unless we put in more energy than it takes to go over to CNN and vote on a frickin' poll, that, which, by the way, has absolutely no legislative power. We are becoming a minority in a lot of ways. Um, and this country was founded on the fact that the majority is not allowed to dictate what the minority is allowed to do. Um, that's how our system of government works. It's worked out pretty well. Uh, we obviously have, have our uh, issues, and our issues are becoming more prevalent now. But this is just one more attempt or one more way that our ability to protect ourselves and our loved ones is being encroached upon. So engage in the conversation. Um, we're going to win this by educating those around us. So instead of calling somebody a libtard or, you know, uh, any kind of other pejorative or derogatory term, actually be like, you know, have a conversation and try to see their side of things. Get into a debate, not an argument. And come armed with facts. Because when they get emotional, sometimes people on the pro-gun side get emotional too, and that's usually when we get a bad name because somebody does something or says something or posts something or creates something that's well, why we can't have nice things. I'm Aaron Count with Sage Dynamics. Debate accordingly.